Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here for this uh, interesting conversation that I'm going to have. You know, the book says Mantras for Success, and then you've got names of 30 of India's CEOs on the cover and their stories in this book. And yet we have the finance minister of this country here for this conversation and for the launch. So anyone who tells you that maximum government is over is fooling you. So let's, let's not be fooled by any of that. Government continues to be very relevant when it comes to business and doing business in India. Let me start by quoting Sohail and what he says in his book. He says, there's something unique about being an Indian CEO in India. I'm going to ask you if it's any different for a Dutch CEO or an American CEO, uh, Sohail. You go on to say that Indian CEOs have to navigate many minefields before even thinking of reaching the consumer. And once they do, the vagaries of doing business in India are so challenging that it takes a lot of courage, at times guile, perhaps even foresight, to get on with what they wish to achieve. Mr. Jaitley, this is perhaps not the first time that you've heard this charge being made about the Indian government, the vagaries of the Indian government, despite the fact that your government talks about minimum government and maximum governance, despite the fact that you talk about the ease of doing business. You cannot wish this away as a problem of your predecessors. This continues to be a problem of your government as well. If I can just give you one illustration, and that has to do with multi-brand retail, for instance, because this is a stated policy of the previous government. Your government has not done a U-turn yet. You haven't repealed the law as it exists. Uh, doesn't that then amount to the vagaries of doing business in India? And how are you moving away in that sense from an era of retrospective action? <laughs> well, it has nothing to do with retrospective action. Well, it is a retrospective action because it's the law of the land. No, but one minute, one minute. Away. I have not referred to the government. I have re I'm a marketing person. I've talked about challenges for the consumer. You've yeah, got but linguistic you challenges, you've got distribution challenges, cold chain challenges. Those so you're defending the government? No, I'm not defending the government. I'm defending my interpretation in the book. So you believe that the government is supportive and nature nurturing of Indian businesses? I would hope so. That's, that's, not, that's not the sentiment that a lot of people here would, uh, would hold as well. But let me get Mr. Jaitley to answer that. Mr. Jaitley, uh, the vagaries of doing business in India, and a lot of that is linked to what the government and government policy does or doesn't do. Well, obviously, the governments are elected on the strength of their policy. Governments announce their policy in advance. They get voted on that basis. And therefore, when people vote for them, they know what roadmap to expect from the governments. And therefore, these are not vagaries of business. This is uh, an essential aspect of any democratic polity. Mm. So anywhere in the world where you have democratic elections and you choose a particular party in power, you know fully well what the policy of the party in any given field is going to be. But yet the action is retrospective because that was the law of the, the land. The action is not retrospective. Policies can change. In fact, uh, the action that you mentioned, as you rightly said in your opening comment, has not been changed. Yeah. In fact, I have always mentioned that in this one area that you referred to, unless there is a broad consensus within the society, not merely within the political field, that with regard to a particular policy decision, mm. it may not be ideal for the governments to move on that road map. Because even if you take a policy decision, you will find yourself not able to implement this as it happened to the last government on this very issue itself. Okay. You know, the government has often made the, the, the whipping boy, Mr. Jaitley. So let me use this opportunity to ask you, what is it about corporate India that you believe ought to change? What is it about corporate India <laughs> and CEOs of corporate India that you don't admire as much? <laughs> well, this, corporate... is, this is the perfect opportunity for you to give it back to them. They're constantly talking about what you get wrong. I think corporate India is good when the going is good. <laughs> When the going becomes challenging, <laughs> corporate India then looks up to the government and say, I can't invest, public investment must be stepped up, environment <laughs> must be changed, it's only then that we come and step in. Mm. And therefore, uh, uh, corporate India needs to be encouraged, for which the system must do well, the governments must do well, and then I'm sure the corporate India would also do quite well. So you believe that there is a, <laughs> there, there is a growing sense of needless impatience? I think... Uh, Governance, uh, at least in the matters of economy, is a great partnership between corporate India, entrepreneurs at various levels and governments. Governments are doing their work and in this partnership we are expecting the other partner now to perform. And do you believe that they haven't stepped up to the no, job No, I won't say that. I won't say that. I think uh, from an environment which was not very conducive, mm. Uh, 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 they are waiting for the whole environment uh, to change so that they can actually see the results on the ground. 
Okay. So hey, let me ask you about something else that you talk about and you talk about the social cost that a leader incurs in India. You say India and Indians don't take easily to failure. We consider failure a sign of inherent foolishness or the inability to read things right. Success cannot be achieved without failure. I don't think anybody would argue or dispute that. But when the government spends more than it earns, you accuse the government of fiscal profligacy. When corporate India does that, you say they're leveraging the balance sheet. When there is no acknowledgement of the fact that strategic misadventures may have caused uh, great erosion as far as shareholder wealth and value is concerned, why do we walk away or shy away from holding corporate India accountable for strategic misadventures? And we've got plenty of examples. I completely agree. In fact, uh, the context in which I wrote those lines about failure was that America is far more forgiving on failure because they believe in moving on. Here, the stigmatization which is associated with failure endures, it lingers. So, you know, I mean, a recent case in point is Vijay Malia. So, all his businesses will now be indexed to how he managed one airline, which then obviously crash landed. But the reality is that there were brands that the man built, which have now kind of been obliterated. Whether it's right or wrong is another matter. A, B, Indian society is very unforgiving qua failure. How many parents have you heard who actually go out in society and say, you know, my son has just failed his exam mm. or my son couldn't get this job or my son has lost out on this or is, he's still unmarried or something like that. I mean, unmarried is just in a manner of speaking. <laughs> so there are these, uh, there are these issues uh, about corporate India. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get down to specific examples. But do you believe that uh, in India we've sort of shied away from holding corporate CEOs responsible and accountable? You you do that with the government. You'll have reams of paper and the press going after the government. But we don't do that when it comes to corporate India. There is this sort of glorification of failure, even when it comes to corporate India. And you seem to be. Uh, sort of talking about that in the book as well. I, I think you've made a very important point. I genuinely believe that the accountability of CEOs in India to shareholders is far less than it is in other developed economies. And uh, the finance minister is absolutely right when Mr. Jaitley says, when you need the government, then you cling on to the government. Uh, often CEOs or industry turns towards government for hand-me-downs or yeah, saving yeah. them. But these are the realities, so I think that needs to change. The fact that you've got a black money bill which has now come in or is, is going to take effect, the fact that you've got a government that's cracking the whip on what I would call illegal, unethical behavior mm. are good signs. We've got to become more accountable. You cannot have CEOs not going to jail, whereas uh, ministers or parliamentarians or whoever spending long years in jail. And I'm a great believer if you've made a mistake... And if that mistake is willful and intentional, you need to be punished. You either need to be punished by being dismissed mm. from the role that you occupy or you need to be punished in a, in a more punitive manner, either economically okay. or, by being, or by being sent to jail. Mr. Jaitley, you wanted to come in on that? You see, governments are always accountable. Politicians as a class are accountable. In fact, we are accountable every day to the media, we are accountable <laughs> to parliament, we are accountable to the voters, we can be kicked out of power. Corporate India is also accountable because if they fail, then they exit the market. Mm. There's no place for failure. <laughs> These are amongst the more accountable institutions. The least accountable institutions is first the media. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> first the media and a very close second is the judges. <laughs> I was quite certain that I would get that pecking order, uh, but, uh, but, but Mr. Jaitley, let me, let me continue with that conversation because I don't want to make this a tutu meme between the media and the government, but let me get back to Sohail's book. And, and in the book, he says, the one quality most great CEOs possess is the ability to insulate and isolate. They insulate themselves from a skeptical world that often comes in the way of their grand plan, and they isolate themselves from the chatter of a world that perhaps doesn't know as much as they do. I would imagine it applies to politicians and leaders in government as well. Let me ask you this in the context of what is currently happening as far as the land bill is concerned. Your own allies oppose your version of the land ordinance. The opposition is united in opposing the land ordinance in its current avatar. In the rarest of rare cases, we've actually seen parliament being prorogued, and you've made uh, this a decision of your government to prorogue the budget session of parliament so that you can re-promulgate the land ordinance. Is this, in that sense, if I could call it, your nuclear moment? 
government. Uh, Manmohan Singh was willing to, to give away political capital, give away his position of power at that point in time for the nuclear bill. Uh, the UPA was willing to do that for the multi-brand retail policy. Is the land ordinance your nuclear moment, if I could call it that? I think that's uh, <coughs> uh, a comparison um, uh, which may not be exactly correct. Uh, just in terms of a numbers, nuclear, you don't have the problem policy, that they do. The nuclear deal was just a one-off policy. The land bill is going to determine a very large part of the progress India makes in particularly certain areas. And I'm not going to start with industry. For instance, in the, the 2013 bill, I've repeatedly said this, yes. that it's a bill which is hostile to the interest of rural India. Sure. There are 300 million people in rural India who are landless. Dr. Ambedkar used to say that their best guarantee is going to be, as far as the Dalits are concerned, that you have industrialization mm. in that region. So you prevent industrial corridors coming up in rural areas. There is going to be no jobs for these 300 yeah. million people. Secondly, rural infrastructure. Our farmer today, if you've seen the plight of the farmer in the month of March, particularly when you had unseasonal rains, sure. you had drought last year, you need irrigation facilities. Yeah. The 2013 law says no land for irrigation, no land for rural roads, no land rural electrification. And therefore, if you are going to change the face of that part of India, mm. you see the mm. industrialists sitting here, if they need land, for industry will probably buy agricultural land and try and get it converted. For those who run the large real estate companies will mm. buy agricultural land, start building major townships. They can take care of themselves. Mm. But it is this area where you need rural infrastructure, where you need irrigation, where you need industrialization in those rural areas for which you need land. And therefore it's an important moment for India. Now, I don't think it's, uh, it's in that sense, as far as the government is concerned, both in terms of a majority in the lower yeah. house, a majority in both houses taken together, we have a comfortable figure. And therefore, we are just going about straight away the constitutional way, mm. when there is uh, a conflict over a particular law, how is that law to be passed? And mm. we firmly believe, and we firmly believe that it's a law which is going to help India mm. and therefore those changes are required as far as the land acquisition bill is concerned. I, I don't want to get into the merits of uh, each of the clauses that the ordinance uh, has put forward but you know I, and this is something that I, I, I think it was Anand Mahindra and Sunil Mittal both in their stories in your book so well have, uh, have spoken about uh, uh, you know about taking people along. Uh, you were talking about the process, Mr. Jaitley, and in terms of the process, because your government also believes now in fostering and nurturing a federal structure, would it not have been correct then to get state chief ministers on board, now that there is significant opposition to your version of the ordinance, to have a conversation on what would be acceptable to them and then let state governments decide? I know on some clauses, I like the social think, impact I, assessment, I, 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 you've, you've said that states can decide, but shouldn't no, the process have been more on, consultative? On, on two counts, you're probably not well informed. A, before we embarked upon this exercise, there was a meeting. We called every I state know that. government. We called every state government. Yeah. And every state government unanimously said, we want a change to the 2013 law. Chief ministers of Congress and UPA governments, Maharashtra for example, yeah. wrote letters to the center for heaven's sake, please amend this law. Mm. Chief minister of Haryana, then UPA, refused to accept the central law, the four time compensation. Yeah and offered much less. So we went through the exercise of building consensus, unanimously the chief minister said so. Notwithstanding that, we put a provision that it's for the state government to decide whether to notify this part sure. or not. So we leave it to the state government. So if Bihar chief minister says, I don't need land for irrigation in my state, so be it. But he can't stop Maharashtra. Sure. So yeah. real federalism is completely the opposite of what you think it is, and which is that one state can't prevent another from enacting mm. a law. India is not merely cooperative federalism. India is also competitive federalism. A state which doesn't want to move further 
can't prevent a more progressive state. All right. All right. Let me now talk to you, Suhail, about uh, something that Anand Mahindra has said in his book is one of his mantras for success. He says, if you want to lead a large, complex, multi-business organization, you have to know when and how to let go and empower others. Empowerment is the algebraic outcome of curiosity and humility. How good are Indian CEOs, Indian promoters at giving up control? I think slowly they are. They're giving up uh, management control for sure. Uh, you see enough stories uh, of, you know, CEOs or, or owners or promoters actually hiring professionals to run their companies. Mm. I mean, Anand talks about it. Look at Anand's structure. It's completely a federal structure. You know, he's, he's for all practical purposes, he's the executive chairman, but he has CEOs running those businesses. I, I think, you know, Rakesh is here. Mr. K.P. Singh is here. Anarjit is here. They all, they all have their CEOs running their businesses. Mm. So I don't think we are still in that time warp where the promoter wants to call the shots. Yes, there is more accountability in, in this relationship now, which wasn't there earlier. And this whole thing about family retainers being elevated to positions of CEO just because the owner trusts them, that period is also over. So we're seeing that significant change. Having said that, many professional managers in this country have also stuck on to their jobs without any shareholder accountability. They continue to remain, I mean, much like, you know, every season's Christmas tree. Let's, let's talk about uh, this in the context of the government, Mr. Jaitley. How hard is it to empower? How hard is it to let go? The criticism of the previous government was that there was no centralization. Everyone was doing their own thing. The criticism of your government is that there is too much centralization and there is one power center that's driving everything. Well, I think um, uh, the previous government had a lot of centralization, but outside the government. <laughs> Our government... Uh, so you accept that there is a power center that's dictating what every ministry and what every minister ought to do? In any parliamentary democracy, a prime minister is the natural leader of the government. A cabinet functions around the prime minister. Ministers hold office at the pleasure of the prime minister. Sure. He has to have confidence in them. And therefore, to have a strong political leader as a prime minister is a strength of democracy. It's not a weakness. Mm. In fact, the weakness of democracy is that you have a prime minister who's like a CEO, but the board of directors sits outside the government. Now, that kind of a system we've experimented for 10 years and it didn't work. Mm. And therefore, I'm quite... But what are the perils of too much centralization? No, I don't think too much centralization was 1975, where you almost had a... Not 2014, system, not 2015. System, or a monarchic system. That's not the system that you have today. Okay, you're saying you're, that's not the system that you have today. So Neil Mittal, uh, as one of his mantras says, you need to get the right people at the right stage of organizational evolution. If I could ask you this in the context of government and how government functions, uh, you know, the Council of Ministers cannot be a meritocracy because of political compulsions. <coughs> I, I don't think anybody lives under the illusion of that. But is there no space for a brains trust, for deep specialists to actually work with the government? The hope was that the Niti Aayog would fulfill that responsibility or that role. I'm not commenting on who is in the Niti Aayog or not. But my question is, is there no space for specialists to work with the government, especially in this phase of execution where we need to look at what happens to education 10, 20 years down the line, what happens to skills 20 years down the line? You need an out-of-the-box approach. You need a new way of thinking. And that doesn't seem to be the case even as far as your government is concerned. You see, you need specialists. Uh, you can have a specialist from within the civil service. You can have specialists in bodies like the Niti Aayog. You can have it in other advisory bodies, people who advise government. But then, as far as the cabinet is concerned, you have to have elected people. Sure. And therefore, in the name of specialists, uh, the unelected really cannot run a system. Unelected can only advise the government. They can guide the government. Sure. And every government has its own uh, uh, kind of people, friends, admirers, advisors, uh, insiders, outsiders. But can there not be an institutional mechanism, Mr. Jaitley, as opposed to friends and advisors? That, you know, if I could but quote that's not, to you. That's not the system that you have in India, 
where you can have an unelected gov- person as a part of the government. Uh, the government I, must necessarily have an elected person. If I could person. quote to you the outgoing CEO of Vodafone who, uh, who recently did an interview with me and he said very often the Indian government uh, makes policies that are not in the best interest of the sector or even in the best interest of the country. And that seems to be a problem that we're faced with sector after sector. And it's in that context that I ask you my question. You see, I, I think that's an extreme statement because you see, irrespective of the government in power, Governments can go wrong, but governments consciously, no government would act in what in its own wisdom is something not in the interest of the country. Government can go wrong, companies go wrong. Sure. And therefore, uh, uh, I don't think this whole trial system of a, of a particular decision and exploring new fields uh, can really be considered as governments uh, deciding wrongly on a deliberate basis itself. Mm. After all, within the government, there is a settled system where there is a lot of consultation which takes place. There is a lot of accountability that the governments have. There is a lot of uh, discussion in parliament, outside parliament, in the media that takes place, which finally culminates into a decision. Mm. You know, another question that I want to ask you, and I think uh, through the course of the stories that we've read in the book, uh, this tendency of the government to micromanage, okay? You can fly to a certain area, uh, you will have to fill a number of seats if you fly to a certain area, and only then we will allow you to fly international. Uh, you can, you know, you can open a store in a certain area, you will be able to store Swedish meatballs or not store Swedish meatballs. I mean, this is 2015, Mr. Jaitley. You want to tell corporates where to spend their money, how to spend their money, what to spend their money let in me, the garb of corporate let me, let me social take you responsibility. On to the first illustration that you yeah. gave. <laughs> This is 2015 and therefore in 2015, taking your example, every area should be connected. And therefore if somebody looks only at India and the large size of Indian population, one sixth of the world population and wants to enter India and say I want to make India my hub so that I get the Indian flag and I fly all over the world. But then I am not interested in flying to Srinagar, I am not interested in flying to Manipur, I am not interested in flying Mm. to some other remote Sikkim. And therefore, these are all areas that you must connect yourself to. Any prudent government, any responsible government, any elected government, Mm. and any government which responds to the people will have to then think of Manipur, Mm. will have to think of how Agartala is to be connected, and will have to think of 20 other factors. It's only the unelected, and here I refer to your earlier question, who would think that Commercially, it is prudent only to fly to New York and not to Agartala. Mm. But then India in 2015 remains a complex puzzle. And therefore, to relate to that complexity of India, you must actually relate to the ground realities of India. So, you, you want to... So, the policy is, not, policy is not as absurd as uh, no, but, the expert may no, point no, but out. No, but my, my point to you, Mr. Jaitley, is that you can very clearly articulate and say, well, if you choose to do this, you can fly. But if, if the government believes that this should not be the policy, 5 by 20 should stay or not stay, be clear about that. Why, why impinge on a commercial decision because you want regional connectivity? You see, you impinge on commercial decisions because the commercial growth of the country and the economic growth of the country the investment of the country also must have an equity behind it. You can't have a situation. Now look at look at what uh, this is a statement our government keeps repeating. Just draw a line through the middle of India. Mm-hmm. Bulk of the economic activity is to the west of India and not to the east of mm. India. You have some of the richest states to the east of India. Look at Jharkhand, look at uh, uh, Orissa, to some extent even West Bengal. Now, these are all states which have a huge amount of natural resource, mineral, coal. And surprisingly, your economic activity is only to the west of India. Mm. And to the east of India, you have much higher levels of poverty. And therefore, would it not be prudent then to tie your commercial decisions with this consideration of social equity that yes, we'll allow you to mine there provided you set up an industry there so that the east of India develops. We'll allow you to mine there, provided mm. the entire money mm. coming from that mineral auction goes to those eastern states. That's a part of any responsible governance. Okay. So, Hill, do corporates see it that way? Do they see this as responsible governance? Do they see this as micromanagement? In the 30 interviews that you've done with some of the largest business houses in the country, some of the tallest business leaders in the country, what do they have to say? See, uh, there are two sides to the coin. And let's be brutally honest. Corporate India also indulges in economic conveniences. You know, what's convenient for them at that time of the day is is what's palatable. And and that's true for 
all sectors, all classes of society. I think the finance minister in his comment on connectivity is right because, and, and, and I think the airlines, and that's what we're referring to, or the logistics companies need to recognize that. For instance, do you know that the per capita income in the northeast of India is by far the highest in terms of a cluster, but people don't know it. If you ask people in Delhi about Arunachal Pradesh, they won't have a clue. So there is connectivity that is needed, that is essential. And that connectivity, to my mind, will and needs to be done in what I would call the curative period of any economy. I mean, look at what happened with British Airways before mm. it was privatized. It was mandated, even though at that time there was a lot of trouble in, in, in uh, Ireland. It was mandated to fly. And I was on the, on the Global Advisory Board at that time. And we saw all the comments that were coming up. So I think connectivity is essential. Yes, there is going to be pain. But then there's a lot of pleasure which a lot of corporates then don't want to talk about. So you're saying that there's no micromanagement in corporate India doesn't believe no. uh, or, or gets its way around it. See, I'm not saying this because, uh, you know, the finance minister is here. I was Governments, wondering. I was no, beginning to wonder. No, no, no. I'll tell you. <laughs> we have this disparaging view of a black and white. And we've forgotten that there are more than 50 shades of grey. So, no, we, 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 we won't know that there are 50 shades of grey. They've been short that we so, can't see no, no, 50 shades I, I of grey. There's micromanagement in every realm of our lives. I mean, you must be micromanaging your husband or whoever you're with, or, you know, Ryan's micromanaging, Manik, no, or no, Manik actually is not. micromanaging. So I, I don't think we should look at it from that perspective. I think the critical area of examination is, are we forcing corporates to do things that are uneconomical? Are we forcing corporates to do things that will impact their shareholders? Yeah. Because ultimately, companies are accountable to no one but shareholders yeah. if they are following due process of law. Yeah. And governments also understand the, uh, the value that shareholders have and must derive. Mm. So I think it's, it's pretty equitable if you ask me. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure everybody will agree with that point of view, but, uh, but Mr. Jetley, let me ask you this in terms of misplaced priorities. And, and uh, uh, Sohail was talking about the 50, 50 shades of grey. And, uh, and I'm drawing parallels here between government functioning and, uh, and corporations, because very often corporations also have misplaced priorities in terms of the strategic decisions that they make, and very often governments also have misplaced priorities in terms of the decisions that they take. Really, is this... In the current context, when you actually have an agrarian crisis, when you actually have trouble across the north and the western parts of India, in the farms, to talk about banning beef, to talk about Marathi cinema being made mandatory in cinema halls in Maharashtra, does it not reek of a sense of misplaced priorities? Well, I'm given to understand this was a decision taken some 10 years ago. <laughs> it's only that news channels realized it yesterday when somebody reaffirmed it. And therefore, your own but ignorance, your own ignorance can't refer to it as a, as a priority. So, therefore, in a state, if because of their own language, people had a priority, Tamil Nadu may have its own, West Bengal may have its own. If Maharashtra took a decision 10 years ago, mm. when some other government was in power, it's just that the minister reaffirmed it yesterday. But you don't think that this is a case of misplaced priorities? Well, I, I don't think it's a case of priority because it doesn't run contrary to any other economic priority or decision making that the government has. Mm. It doesn't affect my functions as far as uh, management of the economy is concerned. It's certainly uh, an occasion for somebody to put it up as a big news item. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move away from news items. And so, uh, you know, at the end of it, at the end of these 30 stories that you've chronicled in your book, what is the one thing that gives you hope? And what is the one thing that all of these leaders have spoken about in terms of what they would like to see from policy points of view, what they would like to see from a, a bureaucratic process point of view, in terms of India really emerging well and truly as an equitable, fair superpower. Remember this book was written over the previous government and this. So it, it takes into account both and the recurring theme in almost every corporate leader's uh, mantras or belief statements is two things. A, an enormous sense of belief in brand India. That India, Indian consumers, the Indian corporate structure, Indian government, we are on a roll. So there's a lot of optimism that one is seeing. The second, which is very interesting, which I didn't expect, is there's a huge emphasis on values. Mm. I mean, you might dismiss it, but there's a huge emphasis. In fact, Ratan uh, Tata, in his 
chapter talks about, uh, one of his mantras is values more than valuation. Yeah. So there is a huge emphasis on the, on the social compact, on the social contract. There's a huge emphasis on giving back. And, you know, uh, we, we were talking about this in a, in a different context. Philanthropy today is being seen not as just uh, donating money. Yeah. It's actually being seen as inclusive, sustainable, and for communities to develop. Sure. So I think that is, is a great sign. Okay. Mr. Jetley, uh, let me end by asking you this. And you said that it's time now for corporate India to step up and partner or work with the government. We've just seen banks being nudged to move on rates, and we've seen uh, banks cutting rates uh, as of yesterday. Uh, do you believe now that there is enough juice in the system to start the economy, uh, uh, to see a real turnaround as far as the economy is concerned? Do you now see private capex cycles turning around? And what gives you hope today? As the finance minister, uh, everyone is talking about the policies that you're unveiling, the steps that you're taking, the measures that you're putting forward. But what gives you hope personally today? Well, there are several factors. I think the first and most important factor is that uh, in the last few years, what was probably a low phase for us as far as the economy is concerned, I think that's over. Secondly, the kind of decisions which have been taken over the last one year, uh, if I put it in a nutshell, opening ourselves entirely for investment, right. opening newer areas for investment, unleashing ourselves in areas which had come to a standstill, right. and therefore all these decisions from insurance to defense to mining to coal to this new impetus on uh, infrastructure particularly a lot of money going into highways uh, railways uh, i've today cleared a proposal for both these sectors to have uh, a large investment by way of tax free bonds which i announced in the budget and a series of these decisions i think uh, they are going to generate a lot of economic activity now, as it is, the Indian normal, as far as growth is concerned, is not 4%, 5%, where any other part of the country would be, world would be very excited about it. The second important part aspect is that most other competing destinations for investment are facing challenging as difficult situations themselves. So whether it's Brazil or it's South yeah. Africa or it's Europe, uh, you know, Japan, uh, even the new Chinese normal is no longer 9%. 7.5, uh, yeah. It's, it's around 7%. Yeah. And therefore, for an economy like India, which is currently targeting about a 8% growth rate and eventually targeting a little higher uh, growth rate, in this renewed environment, I think uh, uh, probably the roadmap does indicate uh, uh, that uh, we are going to do much better than what we have in the region. <coughs> But what gives you the most hope? <laughs> well, a, a series of factors. Uh, I think Indian entrepreneurship is, is of a very high level. And therefore, if we can provide that environment to the Indian entrepreneur, they are going to do extremely well. Secondly, the government is committed to a particular roadmap. And therefore, just because somebody gets together and says, I'll block this reform, I am quite willing, I've said this repeatedly, let this be an ideological or a parliamentary struggle between reform and obstruction. Mm. I have not the least doubt that reform is going to succeed at the end of the day. And therefore, those who want to be on the side of the obstruction um, can be there. But that's not, we've seen it in the last session of parliament. Despite obstruction, I got the insurance through, I got mining through, I got coal through. And I'm quite certain that important challenges like uh, the GST, the Companies Act, the kind of taxation reforms which we are making. Mm. It's not very easy in India to force a situation like the GST in indirect tax or to bring down the direct tax corporate rates down to 25%. Well, we are fairly determined to go on that road track. So let me end by asking you, Mr. Jaitley, and I'll ask Sohail as well. If you, were given, if you were given a chance to sort of do things over again, would you be a lawyer, a politician, or an entrepreneur? <laughs> you know, I've always wondered which is the best life, and I think it is to be a Suhail Singh. <laughs> <laughs> which category does he fall into? I don't know. I don't think he fits into any of these categories. He wakes up every morning as a very happy man. 
he spends his day, he is full of life, he makes us uh, enjoy himself. In fact, the only chapter missing in this book is the mantra of his success. Because a lot of people wonder what he really does to have achieved this book. Uh, uh, let's, let's, that, that, that gives us the perfect ending, Sohail said. What is your mantra for success? And we what have, exactly do you do? Uh, I'm actually advising the Niti Aayog on nomenclature to change it to the Planning Commission. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Mr. Jaitley, for fielding Thank all you. our questions. And to say, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs>